everybody, it's Crystal with Fertility Blues, and I'm with Fertility Coach, and today on the show, we have Dr. Kristen Buchan, who is my personal friend, my personal naturopath, and somebody that means a whole lot to me. And we are talking today all about hormones, which is amazing, hormones 101, hormones on why they impact our fertility. We're talking estrogen and progesterone and... Um, Oh my gosh, what else? Thyroid glands and adrenals and all that kind of fun stuff. So tune in. Show starts right now. Don't miss it. Hey everybody, my name is Crystal with Fertility Blooms and I'm a fertility coach. And today on the show, I'm so happy to have Dr. Kristen Wooten, my personal friend, my naturopath, and a doctor I recommend all the time because she has so much knowledge in the fertility world. She's actually a board member for Fertility Blooms. Oh my goodness, Blooming Hopes. We're just going to get keep going here. Blooming Hopes, um, which is a nonprofit that I founded and Kristen jumped on board. And welcome, Kristen. Thanks, Crystal. I'm excited to be here. Um, okay. So what's your clinic called? Balance Integrative? Balance Health. Integrative Health. So yeah. I'm a naturopathic doctor, as Crystal mentioned, but I'm also the owner of a clinic in Burlington, Ontario, in Canada. It's called Balance Integrative Health. We've got an amazing team of different practitioners that can help support from physical health issues, mental, emotional health issues. And then I'm there offering naturopathic consults, acupuncture, IV therapy, along with some other amazing naturopaths too. So. Absolutely. And I, I'm going to say this before I forget. If anybody wants an in-person visit now that COVID's over, I see patients at balance as well. So you can book that online because some people want to have the personal, like me screaming at them in their face kind of thing. And that's especially fun. after the year and a half that we've had, it's yeah. Yeah. I have patients, we have such strict policies at the clinic that I have patients who come to the clinic just to get out of their house. And it's a really nice comforting environment. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we used to actually run the fertility support groups at Kristen's clinic too, um, mm -hmm. pre-COVID before Zoom. So maybe we'll get back to that. I know I've been having uh, people ask if we would do in-person um, events or support groups soon. So we'll get yeah. back one day. Yeah, exactly. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Um, okay, so we're talking hormones 101. Let's talk the basics, but I know it will be for a lot of us, um, we hear when we're going through um, fertility, your hormones are off, or we'll hear words like progesterone and estrogen and every all the other hormones, but we don't actually know what that means. Like, what does that mean? Why do our hormones need to be balanced? How did they get unbalanced? Why do we have to take those nasty uh, progesterone suppo suppositories? I'm sure I can attest for every girl that's gone through IVF that's had those really hates them or the pio shots are even equally nasty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what are, where, how many, what are our hormones? Like yeah. break it down. Like let's start at the basics. <laughs> the hormones, they're a big thing that I talk about with patients because there's so many hormones in our body and they all do different things. But essentially when we look at like what they are is they're the chemical messengers in our body. So they're produced by different glands in our body. You may have heard of like the adrenal glands or the pituitary gland. They're the two kind of biggest ones that produce hormones, but those glands produce hormones that then those hormones are those messengers and they send those messages to different tissues and different organs in the body to tell them to do something. So they're kind of the thing that turns the switches on or off of our different hormones and tissues to make them function ideally the way that they should, but sometimes they get mixed messages or the signals get mixed up and the messengers cross paths the way they shouldn't. And that's where we see some imbalances and different issues go on. So, okay. So why I know personally, because um, that's why we have Bluma skincare, but what, what else, like people have probably heard me talk over and over again, that when you put like um, body lotions and anything on our skin, like perfumes and things like that with fragrances, that can disrupt our hormones. And I talk about that a lot, but how does that actually, like, why does that, why can a perfume or a body cream, how does that mess our hormones and how does it actually mess up our fertility? So with products, I know that's the thing you talk about, also other toxins in the environment, whether it's things in the air that you're breathing in or toxins on your food or yeah. like 
like your cleaning products that you use at home. There's so many different places that we can get toxins, but how they impact our hormones or the biggest way they impact our hormones is they can mimic the look of some of the hormone messengers in our body. And so when that happens, those kind of particles or those chemicals can go and turn the receptors on our organs and tissues on or off when they really shouldn't be turned on or off. So that can disrupt that signaling and that pathway and cause just different hiccups and changes in there. So it's really that those toxins, some of them look close enough to the hormones that they'll mimic them. Sometimes they block those hormones from being able to attach to those receptors and they don't actually do anything. So it really just impacts that signaling and things being able to turn on and off. Oh, so, okay. So what's a sign? And I, mm-hmm. I'll just say the one that I know that's the most common for when people tell me that this is happening to them. I always think your hormones are out of bounds. So yeah. it's usually your cycle. So if somebody has a really short cycle or somebody has a really long cycle, I'll usually recommend them go see a naturopath or we'll do some other things um, with me mm-hmm. to balance their, them. Um, so that would be like one of the big indications that your hormones are out of balance. But what are some of the other ones? Or is that, am I right? Am I right? <laughs> well, that's the biggest one, especially in the fertility world that people will come yeah. in to see me and they don't really know what's going on. They may not even be working with a fertility clinic yet, but they're like, my cycle was always regular. And for some reason, the past year, year and a half, it's been off or even the last cycle or two, it's either come early or urban late or they're starting to think of trying to have a baby, they're doing the LH strip pus and they are never getting that high. And that's a big indication that there's something going on in a hormonal standpoint, because like you were mentioning the estrogen and progesterone, our cycles are very much mediated by those hormones, but other signs that there could be something going on, like there could be hormone imbalances in the body and your cycles can be regular. Things that we look for are weight. If you're having trouble losing weight, trouble gaining weight, that can be a sign that hormones are out of balance. If you're feeling tired all the time, fatigue, we always look at nutrient deficiencies like iron and B12, but that could be a sign that things like maybe estrogen's low, your thyroid could be out of balance. The thyroid's another hormone that comes up a lot in the fertility world. I know particularly low functioning thyroid, we'll see some like muscle weakness or just you don't have that same like motivation and that same muscle endurance so you're like I used to be able to run I can't run very far so let's say two kilometers and now <laughs> you find get tired by the one kilometer mark and that you really haven't changed anything so we do look at some of those other ones mood is another big one yeah so feeling yeah. anxious low moods difficulty sleeping those can sometimes be linked with other things but hormones that people don't often associate with fertility are melatonin talked about thyroid that's a big one but melatonin is another one that can impact the stress hormone that cortisol balance as well and impact your sleep and your mood so they're always intertwined and because they're those chemical messengers as soon as one of them sending the wrong signal we start to see some of the other hormones come out of balance as well so it's Um, really important to keep an eye on some of those signs and signals that there might be something going on before it turns into a bigger imbalance or bigger issue in the body everything yeah yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So let's talk the two big ones. Well, I guess three because thyroid's in there. Okay. Let's talk estrogen and let's yeah. talk progesterone. Yeah. So what is the importance of estrogen and how can we keep that in check and progesterone? And yeah. We'll what start with we- estrogen. Yeah. Estrogen and progesterone. When people say hormones, they usually think of estrogen and progesterone. Like you're saying, you may need to be on those hormones if you're going through different fertility treatments or just in doing your own research and Googling. If you type in hormones, they're the two that are going to come up. Oh, okay. Estrogen, a lot of people think it's made primarily by the ovaries, but a lot of people just associate it with female reproduction, but it actually can impact tissues and organs all over our bodies. So there's estrogen receptors in our blood vessels and our heart in our digestive system. So all over. And that's why some people, if they're going through perimenopause or when they're in menopause, we have greater risk of things like heart disease or osteoporosis because we don't have those estrogen molecules attaching to the receptors. So estrogen affects our body way more than just our reproductive issue or reproductive health, but focusing on the reproductive health, what estrogen does in our cycle, it's primarily dominant in the first half of our cycle. So that's from the first day of your period is always day one. 
and then up until when you ovulate. And during that time, it's your follicular phase, but that's when the estrogen is responsible for growing that lining in your uterus. So estrogen um, sends the signals to say, okay, we have to make a lining. So it's a very active hormone. And when we know estrogen levels are high, because it's an active hormone, if you think of very active PMS symptoms, so we see things okay. like more irritability, more cramps, more pain, heavier flow. Those are more, and I call it kind of active and angry PMS symptoms are more of an indication that estrogen might be high because it's so active. Its job is to impact that growth. So if you think of it, heavier periods, more painful periods, if estrogen's high, that lining is going to be a lot thicker. Okay. And that's something that we'll sometimes see in things like endometriosis, where it's a thicker yeah. lining that could be because either the estrogen level production is high in the body or your body's not clearing out or filtering out extra estrogen so what can we do to keep it like like how we keep need balance? balance with and it's kind of with estrogen and progesterone in general it's like we were talking about before keeping the toxins as much as we can out of our body there are certain foods you can do some seed cycling or if you look at omega cycling you. Yeah. And that's something you can do. use different omegas at different times of your cycle to help impact and regulate the estrogen and progesterone balance. Things like castor oil packs over the abdomen can be helpful just at reducing inflammation in the lower abdomen and the uh, reproductive area. Not something I'd recommend if you're doing a transfer cycle, though, just right. because you don't want castor oil can be a little bit stimulating even topically so we don't want to stimulate anything too much if you're going to be getting a transfer either IUI or IVF that cycle too but it's kind of keeping the inflammation down decreasing toxins through our food through our products a big one that a lot of people don't think of maybe not so much now but when you get dry cleaning done I always recommend people take the bags off before they bring the clothes in the house because those plastic bags will trap the dry cleaning chemicals on your clothes too and that can disrupt the hormones. I always suggest uh, go to those. Um, there's some natural dry, dry cleaners now, mm -hmm. um, or just don't dry clean people. Yeah. We're living say, in not as much of an issue. Still COVID. Yeah. <laughs> COVID still, it's better to be wrinkly than uh, have those toxins because the yeah. dry cleaners are really bad. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And they are particularly for estrogen. Like there's some supplements and herbs that can be helpful to balance estrogen levels, but you really want to determine whether it's a, issue of your body making too much estrogen or issue of your let's say your liver not filtering out the extra estrogen because if it's more the liver not detoxifying the extra estrogen then we look more at supporting the liver so oh. even eating foods like parsley cilantro rosemary they're all herbs that really help the liver to kind of filter out extra toxins and things like that and that can be helpful just generally to help clear any estrogen build up too and I love cilantro. Oh my God, it's my favorite. Because <laughs> I am not a cilantro person, but I will eat oh, it yeah. if it's good to me. You eat it in the guacamole, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. So that's estrogen. It's that like big active, like I say, the angry PMS symptoms. That could be a sign that your estrogen levels are out of balance. Okay. More the angry symptoms if the estrogen levels are high. If your estrogen levels are low, then that's where, like I always say, just think of the typical menopausal woman. Vaginal dryness, hot flashes, difficulty sleeping, more lower moods, those can be signs that you have too low estrogen. And that may be when they decide to support you with some estrogen therapy throughout your cycle. Sometimes okay. I know with IUIs and IVFs, they'll put you on estrogen anyway, just yeah. so that they're able to control when your body's getting that estrogen and when they can do that trigger. Is and there anything naturally we can take or? Nothing you can recommend they need to see it a job. So it's always better to see a naturopath or see a practitioner just so that the recommendations are tailored to what your needs are. And we'll often yeah. do testing to figure out what your levels are to see what would be helpful. But general estrogen boosting herbs, we see tribulus used a lot, black cohosh, um, angelica, donkai. There's a few different herbs that we'll use quite often if we're wanting to boost up estrogen. Yeah. If we're wanting to help detoxify it, then we look at Things more like milk thistle for the liver, schisandra and rosemary are other good herbs, or we'll use things like dim and I3C, which are found naturally in broccoli and cruciferous vegetables, but yeah. they're things that can help the body detoxify extra estrogen. So broccoli, okay. And everybody, everybody I know I work with, 
they know I'm always preaching about um, broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> and we have, I don't know if you know, but we have a challenge group and we have to do our, our 10,000 steps and we have to have a smoothie every day. And the reward at the end of this month um, is they can have a donut, but I said the donut has to be made out of broccoli. So yeah. <laughs> You gotta make it fun. I know. Well, broccoli don't make fun. So okay. So if you're that's if your estrogen's high. Um, yeah. If it's low, what kind of foods could we try? So if it's low, we look more at the foods that are high in omega threes. So things like okay. pumpkin seeds, flax seeds can be helpful. Avocado, olive oil, coconut oil. The omega threes can help to support that estrogen production in oh. general. So. Oops. And that's where if you look at the seed cycling or omega cycling, you'll see that the first half of the cycle is heavy on the omega-3 foods or the omega-3 seeds because it helps to support that estrogen production. Ah, uh, okay. And I have a little chart I, I always give out with the seed cycling. So yeah. Yeah. You can put a link to that below. Yeah. I was going to say, if you're interested in it, it's just yeah. a really simple way, especially if you're already doing smoothies or if you're having like rice cakes with nut butter or something, you could sprinkle the seeds directly on it. I have some patients where if they're doing stir fry for dinner, they throw the seeds right into the their dinner and you don't really taste it. Yeah. So I'll always recommend people grind, they either grind them, pumpkin seeds, you don't really need to, but flax seeds and then sesame seeds for the second half you would, but grind them in big jars and then store them okay. in your freezer because then when you need to switch or when you're using them you just pull out the jars for where you are in your cycle and you're not having to grind them or like open bags every day oh that's a good idea Ooh, yeah. i like that tip i like that yeah perfect <laughs> we talked about estrogen progesterone was the other question yeah progesterone. yeah so if you again if you google menstrual cycle you'll see there's like the typical when i say the typical like menstrual cycle picture that'll pop up on Google shows in that first half, the lining goes from very, very thin, and then it goes to grow. And then in the second half, it doesn't grow much more. It stays okay. and progesterone essentially helps to maintain that lining. Okay. And that's why it's so important from ovulation till either the end of your cycle or until you have a successful pregnancy is that progesterone is what prevents your body from saying, I don't need this lining and gets rid of it. Okay. And so we need an, enough progesterone in our body to keep that lining thick and keep it viable so that if an egg gets fertilized, it's able to implant into a healthy lining. Ah, uh, okay. That made, yeah. that was like explained really simply. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That so with progesterone and the biggest, though, so estrogen, we talked a lot about estrogen being high. Progesterone, the most common imbalance we'll see with that is low levels of progesterone. Yeah. And that's why progesterone suppositories or even progesterone cream is sometimes such a common thing in the fertility world is a lot of people have low levels of progesterone yeah and that causes so some symptoms and signs to look out for is if you're wondering is my progesterone level low is spotting before your period starts so your first day of your period should be not like a super super heavy day but it should be a heavy or the next day should be heavy so you shouldn't okay. have three, four, seven days of spotting or like, oh, I think it's coming. Maybe not. Is it coming? Maybe not before your period comes. Yeah. What that tells us is usually when they're spotting, it's telling us those progesterone levels have dropped early. So your body's going, well, I don't really need this lining. So I'm going to start getting rid of it earlier. Okay. Then, so that's one of them. Anxiety and difficulty sleeping can be common with progesterone. Progesterone is a very calming hormone. So if you think of it being common, if you don't have enough of that calming hormone, we'll see more anxious symptoms, more difficulty sleeping. I call it more of like the sad PMS. So we'll more often see yeah. like that spotting, lower moods, crying, more bloating, okay. being more like fatigued. So yeah. those can be signs that it might potentially be progesterone levels that are out of balance as well. Okay. Yeah. And what are some foods we could take to increase our progesterone or keep it high? Yeah, so foods for progesterone, like the omega-3s are good for estrogen. Omega-6s are beneficial for progesterone. So often we'll look at omega-6s, things like um, the sesame and sunflower seeds. Yeah. And then you can look at like gamma linoleic acid or like evening primrose oil, borage oil. Those are examples of omega-6s. Yeah. The other things that can be helpful for progesterone is foods that are high in B vitamins. 
we know that B6 is a really important vitamin for progesterone production. So B vitamins are high in lots of the green leafy vegetables. So I'll often recommend the cruciferous vegetables are good for detoxifying estrogen. And then the green leafy vegetables are good for B vitamins. And then taking good quality prenatal will have those high quality B vitamins and the active folic acid that can be helpful too. And the key is good quality. Yes. <laughs> and if you're wondering if yours is good quality or not, chat with Crystal or chat with your naturopath. I feel like I'm like, yeah, as, as spokesperson. For <laughs> yeah. And it's important too, because if you're going to be taking something every day and especially in the fertility world, it's not like you just have one thing to take every day. It's usually no. you're taking all different things. And so if you're going to go through the effort of taking something every day, you want to make sure your body's actually able to absorb it and use it. Otherwise it just, you take it in, your body gets rid of it and you're not getting any of that goodness out of it. So yeah, you're important. making expensive pee. <laughs> yes, very expensive and maybe neon, but neon can be normal for good quality prenatals as well. So don't be deterred if your pee is neon. With it's usually the B vitamins, right? That make your pee yeah. neon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, okay. So how, okay. So we know our moods, if our hormones are out of whack, it's going to affect our mood. It's going to affect our energy levels. Um, mm -hmm. What else can it affect? You have the mood, the energy levels, it can impact our sleep. Oh, okay. It can impact, we talked about the cycle where depending on the hormone imbalance, we'll sometimes see a short follicular phase, which is that first half. So people who ovulate early. Okay. And so if you're ovulating earlier than day 10, then it means when that ovulation happens, that egg isn't very mature. So you may be ovulating every cycle, which is great, but we don't want you necessarily ovulating too, too early because then that egg might be too immature still to be fertilized properly or to turn into a successful egg and have yeah. a successful pregnancy. Okay. Could have a long luteal phase, which is that second half of the cycle. Yeah. And that we'll sometimes see with kind of high levels or low levels of progesterone is kind of that long cycle there. Things like PMS symptoms, like we talked about that you can see the different ones of estrogen and progesterone. If you have things like PCOS or endometriosis, it could be pain or symptoms with ovulation. So pain, sometimes people get spotting with ovulation. Yeah. Sometimes you might notice things like difficulty losing weight, brittle nails, hair falling out, acne. Those can also be signs that there's a further hormonal imbalance going on. And so that's where we always look at estrogen and progesterone. I'll always look at testosterone as well. That's something that is more common to be out of balance in PCOS patients, okay. but it can be in anyone. We want to make sure, even though we think more male fertility and reproduction with testosterone, females still have it too. Mm -hmm. And that's where we also look at thyroid. If we're noticing things like fatigue, low moods, hair loss, constipation, those are when we'd be definitely investigating the thyroid to make sure that it's functioning properly as well. And you said a couple of times, you said, we test, we test. So yeah. your fertility, um, your RE will not necessarily test. Well, no, they won't test for all these kind of things. Um, so that's where a naturopath doctor, Kristen, comes in because she will run the whole gamut plus some blood work. You'll have no blood in your body. <laughs> but it's really important because I always think of it as when you go to the RE, you get your, your, your scans and your ultrasound and we know what's going on. And when you go to the naturopath, you know what's going on with your hormones and they check everything. Like they will, can check everything. So you know where you stand. So I always say it's a good starting point because then you know where to move forward from, right? And with, um, and yeah, with my fertility patients, if they're working with an RE, the first thing that I do, or if I know that they're, if I chat with them before their first appointment and know they're going through different treatments, or even just at that starting investigation phase, is I always have them either bring in a copy of any of the blood work, any of the imaging they've had done there, because if they've just had certain blood work done, I don't need to necessarily retest it. Yeah. But like you were saying, the fertility clinics are specifically looking at your reproductive organs. They'll look at the estrogen, progesterone. Most of them will test thyroid yeah. at, at a base level. They don't they test only, all the, yeah, yeah, they just have, check your TH. Um, yes. The TSH. Yeah. yeah. So 
if the TSH comes back and it's normal, but we're still seeing symptoms of the thyroid being out of balance, then we'll run a full thyroid panel, which includes the free T3, free T4, and thyroid antibodies as well. Yeah. And more of what you get when we do the kind of more comprehensive blood work is we're looking at what's going on in your body as a whole. So we're not just narrowed down to your reproductive organs and those hormones. We're looking at what is happening in your body as a whole. Is there inflammation? Is there any autoimmune conditions going on? So we'll often look at a few different autoimmune markers. What are your nutrient levels like? Are your iron levels low? Are your B12 levels low? Because those are all things that can impact not just your cycle, but also your overall health, how your body feels and your ability to, if you have a successful transfer for your body to maintain that pregnancy as well. That's what I always say. And I say this in the group and in the, the booster group, I always say, it's not just about getting pregnant. We want to be, have a healthy pregnancy, but we also want to be healthy moms right? Yeah. You got to be there for your kid. You got to have the energy levels and you don't want to start figuring this out after you give birth. You need to get it all, all fixed up now. <laughs> yeah. So, you won't have much time after you give birth. So if yeah. you get yourself feeling and feeling as best as you can, then you're going to be at least in a position, like the best position you can be to help support yourself throughout. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So is there, what's the best way to balance our hormones? Is it diet? Is it de-stressing? Is it exercise? Is it supplements? Is it, I, I think it's all of those things, but I don't know. What I say, that's, don't know. As you're listing them, I'm like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and so there are tons of ways that you can balance your hormones and there's not one thing that's better than others. Okay. It's really about not letting yourself get overwhelmed and that is easy to say not so easy to do in the fertility world in general because there is a lot of information out there and there's a lot of different people telling you different things and coming at you from all different angles saying you need to do this you need to do that one of the things that I'll recommend is like in terms of diet reducing the inflammation in your diet as much as possible this doesn't necessarily mean everything out yeah but it doesn't mean cutting everything out and only being able to eat like a rabbit. Mm -hmm. It The biggest thing that I'll have people start with is start keeping either a journal or on your phone, a log of how you feel after you eat. So you don't even have to start by cutting anything out. Just start with that awareness of, okay, how do I feel after I eat? See if that changes throughout your cycle. Because people generally eat the same things and see if you notice, okay, like I'm eating the same things, but I'm more tired around ovulation or... See if you are feeling tired after you eat. If you eat and you notice a dip in energy and then it comes back up, it's telling us that there may be some foods that your body's having a hard time breaking down. If people want to cut out, and I sometimes have people come in saying like, what are the top things to cut out? Say like the top three are gluten, dairy, and eggs. And they're just what we see the most common inflammatory foods. Yeah. And so if you have- Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but you don't have to cut them all out either. So you can do the food sensitivity testing where it tells you specifically what your body is reacting to in terms of inflammation from foods, yes. or you can start, and I call it a rotating elimination diet where you cut out gluten for three weeks, see how you feel. You can add gluten back in, see how you feel. If you don't notice any difference in how you feel, it doesn't mean you want to eat it all the time. But having a little bit here and there is likely not going to be the one thing that is impacting your fertility. Okay. Yeah. Then you can, let's say, do dairy and do the same thing with dairy, where you do want to be fairly strict for those three weeks cutting them out. But yeah. then just monitoring, how do you feel? How's your cycle? I'll usually have my fertility patients cut things out for at least a cycle and a half. So it's usually more like four to six weeks. Yeah. Because then we can see... Is your PMS different without that food? Uh, Is the acne that you get before your period usually different when we've cut out gluten or cut out dairy? And then we can kind of see that impact a little bit more. Yeah. The foods are definitely reducing inflammation. That way is a big one. Exercise doesn't have to be running. Like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not a big runner, but even integrating that exercise with that kind of stress management can be going for a walk every day. It can be doing yoga and stretching. It can be doing a 20 minute 
work out on an app that you have at home. It can be jumping on your Peloton or going for a run or going for a bike ride if that's what you enjoy doing. But the biggest thing with exercise is if you're doing exercise and it's causing stress, then it's not having as much of that beneficial impact on your body as if you were doing a type of movement or activity that you enjoy. So I have some patients where their activity is putting on headphones, putting on music they love and dancing exactly. around their room for half an hour. Yeah, exactly. And that counts as cardio. <laughs> It does. It does. <laughs> so it's kind of mixing that exercise that people usually associate negative things with, with something that you enjoy that'll either make you happy or help calm you and relax you because that's going to help balance that stress hormone cortisol, which also can impact things like estrogen and progesterone levels and thyroid and all of that, those fun hormones. <laughs> That's why we have our, I should add you to the boosters. It's only for fertility warriors, but I should add you now. Um, because I would do it. I need the, I need the, we have to do the walk and have a smoothie. <laughs> and I've been so bad lately. So, um, yeah, but it's a fun group. I think there's like a hundred of us in the group right now. So <laughs> and that helps to make it fun too, is when you have people that are doing it yeah. with you and you've got that accountability, but then you can also joke with them and bond with them over it being a, Oh, I made a smoothie. It was disgusting today, but I yeah. did it. Like <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So true. Yeah. The accountability and knowing other people have um, struggled with infertility and also it's not easy to always get off the couch and go for a walk or like today, I usually do a walk in the morning, but yeah, it was like pouring rain and thundering when I went. So now I'm only at 6,000 steps. So I know I have to go for a walk after. Yeah. And I don't want to, but I need to post my picture of my time at the end of the day. <laughs> but it's also okay. And that's part of the accountability is giving yourself a little bit of grace too. Like your day yeah. isn't like your typical day. And yeah. if you get to the 10,000, that's okay. But then be like, okay, maybe you only got to 9,000. And not that you want to do that every day. But being like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to get the 10,000 or I'm going to do 11,000 tomorrow to make up for the thousand. Yeah. And I've seen, too. I've seen such progression because some of the girls started because you don't realize how much you don't move during the day, especially working from home. So some of the girls started off at like two, 3,000 a day. And now they're up to 6,000 a day, which is amazing, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, it's just, just the progression. And we have all, now we have the support system. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that movement's so good at circulating those nutrients. I mean, hormones need to circulate through our bloodstream or vitamins and minerals circulate through our bloodstream. So if you're not moving those things, the oxygen doesn't get circulated as well. But then if you have inflammation in your body, it doesn't get to be fleshed out as easily. So it'll sit and it'll yeah. just be like, well, I'm happy here. And if you're not moving, then I'm just going to stay yeah. here until you force me to move. And that's where even, yeah. yeah, just the walking, getting the steps can be really helpful and beneficial. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I may have to like just take this little clip and add it to the group after. You can. <laughs> and then you also mentioned, so we talked about the food, we talked about the exercise. We talked already about cleaning up your products and I know you've yeah. got some other talks about that. So it's really important. The toxins aren't great for hormones. No. But then when you mentioned supplements, there are herbs and there are supplements that can help, but there's not like one supplement that is going to be helpful for everyone. So that's really where it comes down to figuring out what the imbalance is. Yeah. And then, and figuring out how severe the imbalance is. If you we are just seeing there's a couple symptoms of high estrogen, but not everything, then that's usually, I'm a very big believer on start with the basic things. And then we can always add to your plan from there yeah. is maybe we start with diet. Maybe we start with a couple nutrients. So vitamins or minerals that we know help that estrogen detoxification pathway. Then if we're not seeing the changes and sometimes we add more kind of supplements on, or that's where we look at herbs to help shift and balance. Yeah. The big thing with the herbs that I always like to mention, especially when people are working with a fertility clinic, is if you are with the clinic, if they have you on a plan and you're taking hormones, you really want to make sure you're chatting with someone before you start taking some of the herbs. Okay. Because herbs can help shift your hormone levels. We talked about like black cohosh and tribulus, chase tree or vitex is another very common herb that yeah. people read about online that can be amazing for helping with progesterone support. But if you're on hormones for let's say an IUI or an IVF or even just a medicated natural cycle, 
you don't want to be adding in these herbs without talking to someone because that may be too much of a hormone impact. I I took, I read about Vitex and I was on, um, I think just Clomid, maybe it was just a Clomid cycle and I can't remember what else. And I don't know what happened, but the doctor's like, what is going on? Like with whatever. And then we realized, cause I was like, oh, this is supposed to help too. And they're like, you can't take Vitex with this stuff. Or I can't remember exactly it was so many years ago, but they thought I was like a, a crazy person for actually just like Googling and finding out that. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> so not that Googling so, is bad. I know a lot of people say don't Google. I'm a very big Google. believer in people educating themselves, but it's knowing what to do with that information. So I often encourage people if they're already reading stuff, if you see some things online or if you're hearing things from other people, write them down and bring them to your appointment. So you, you yeah. should bring those questions to your practitioner and have those conversations because I've had patients where they've been on medications kind of like you're saying, and they want to start these herbs, but I know there's an interaction yeah. with them. And when you're paying for the fertility meds, when you're paying for a cycle, you don't want to do anything to screw that cycle up. Yeah. If it's something you're doing voluntarily. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's not cheap. Then I've also had patients who they've heard things from other people or read articles and they bring yeah. information to me that I haven't heard of, but then I research it and there's a lot of kind of good things that can come out of that too. Yeah. So never feel bad asking your practitioners these questions, but always make sure you talk to someone before you just start doing everything. Cause if you yeah. do too much at once, it can be too overwhelming for your body too. And and what Kristen's saying is she said, research on Google, not because people know I always preach this also. Do not listen to people on every Facebook group giving advice about medications and so Because <laughs> everyone think, will say something different because uh, everyone's situation is different. And I think it gets everybody spinning out of control. Google is more, um, what's the word for it? Google's more... It More has yeah, yeah, it's not necessarily, not everything you find on Google, and we all know it's not all no. research-based and supported, no. but at least you're able to read it in like a Easy. clear way. And yeah. then I also, I'll have patients where I'll say like, send me links to websites if you're looking at something, or if I know they're wanting to look up a particular topic, I'll sometimes send them more reputable websites where they can get more of that research-supported information. Mm -hmm. So that if they're wanting to read, they're not just Googling and finding someone's blog that wrote that. But just because someone's yeah. recommending something doesn't mean it works for you, but it also doesn't mean it was wrong for them because yeah. everyone's in a different situation. So it's Everybody, taking it all nobody's, Yeah. Nobody's fertility journey is ever the same. <laughs> no. Some clinics may treat you like that, but yes. <laughs> oh my God. If I have to hear the do a monitoring cycle, do your three IUIs and then move to IVF one more time. Seriously. Yeah. Like the <laughs> monitoring cycle that is good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Oh, uh, you yeah. do let your salt. No, 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 no. Like I could, like, I know what they're going to say. Some doctors, I just like when they, when people tell me which doctor they're going to, I'm like, oh, I know your protocol already. Don't worry. <laughs> so I wish that will change and maybe it will change. There's some good doctors out there now. So who knows? <laughs> yeah. And it's all but, the other thing with that kind of like you're saying is some, all clinics are different. Like all fertility coaches are different. All naturopaths are different. Don't be afraid to bounce around until you find a place you're comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always say, make sure you're comfortable and find a team that you can work with. And mm -hmm. it's always nice. And now not all of the fertility specialists and REs will like this, but I go, I'm on a couple like Zoom calls a day with clients um, with their REs. So don't be afraid to jump up, ask some of your support system to work mm -hmm. all together. Sometimes you will work with the REs and the REs will ask you questions like, yeah. like, See, make sure your team is all working together, right? And even or at least like, that they're open to communicating yeah. and sharing reports and results. So I'm, if someone's working at a fertility clinic and we run blood work, I'll always give them a copy of their blood work to take to their fertility yeah. clinic. They may not do anything with it, but then at least it's keeping that information 
transparent and open, or if then let's say your iron levels were low, we added an iron supplement, your reproductive endocrinologist, yeah. they know why. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and I always say like, bring in all the team, like bring in your pharmacist, your massage therapist, whatever. So everybody's kind of like, you know, all the pieces are together. And once you find somebody that you really trust and like and connect with, mm-hmm. stick the road. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So, okay. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to have you on again, obviously, but hormones is probably the one thing that everybody wants to know about and everybody is the most confused about. <laughs> They're complicated. I don't know why, I but like that seems to be the case. <laughs> yeah. We barely even touched the tip of the iceberg with hormones today too. So if there are people who have questions, reach out to Crystal. She can pass them on to me and then we can either do another chat or an Instagram yeah. live or something to help answer some of your questions as well. Absolutely. And all your con- all your contact information will be below. Um, mm-hmm. Kristen does um, 15 minute consultations. Yeah. Um, so you can connect with her below. If you want connect with me, we can all do a group chat, whatever you want. Um, and it's good. Yeah. I'm going to bring you into our support group too, actually one month, probably I'm starting to do the guests. So we'll have you on there as well. So Sounds thank good. you so much. And thank you uh, for having yeah. me. Bye everybody. Bye. Hey guys, what did you think of that interview? Now you guys know so much about hormones. You know how to help balance your hormones. You know what tests you need to take. You know what vitamins to take. You know that walking and movement really help can stabilize everything. You know that diet plays a big role. We learned about estrogen, testosterone, and everything. So if you have any more questions for myself or Dr. Kristen Winton, our links are below. Tap book a session with either of us. We would love to have, um, even with both of us, we've done that before too. So we'd love to have you guys. Um, and that's it. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, though, now's the time. Hit the little bell below. Uh, looking forward to talking to you guys later. Uh, thanks so much. Give us the reviews. Um, give us the comments. We would love to hear your feedback. And if you have any other questions about hormones, please do comments and I'll be sure that Dr. Kristen will answer the Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.